Hello guys, I'm Naor. Um, so you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. It's a podcast about life in Israel that I do with my friend Eitan. Just wanted to let you know before we start with this episode uh, featuring the amazing Uri Geller that uh, you're invited to subscribe to this podcast. It's very easy. If you have an iPhone, just go to iTunes and press Put in two nice Jewish boys search for us and subscribe or if you have an Android device just download the podcast app uh, search for us and subscribe we also have a website www.2njb.com and of course we're on Facebook and on Twitter follow us comment like and share this episode please let's hear this beautiful conversation we've had just a few minutes ago with Uri Geller enjoy and Live from Tel Aviv, two nice Jewish boys, Aitid Weinstein and Naor Mininger. Hi Naor, how are you? I'm great, what's up? Um, good, good. The end of the world officially passed us. Yeah, we're still and alive. Yeah, <laughs> we're still alive. Right. So all, all is good, all is good on this front. <laughs> yeah. Um, But today's I'm, an exciting day. Yeah. Today's I'm an so exciting excited. day. I'm so excited. So today we have with us actually Uri Geller. Hi, Uri. Hi, hi. Hello. Great Uri. being on your podcast. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so I, much. I, I loved your persistence. Uh, you know. <laughs> you we, know, we had to have you. We had. We weren't we, going to give we up. We had to have you, but we were astonished by how swiftly you and kindly you replied to us and treated us with so, so... You know, words can't describe it. It's so no ob- not obvious. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but I'm nice to everyone. Um, and, uh, you're I'll, also a nice Jewish boy. Thanks. I'll tell you how it came to be that I learned to be nice to everyone. When I was about 13, living in Cyprus with my mother, I came to visit my dad here because my parents divorced. And one day I was walking, it was near uh, Mugrabi, um, you know, Mugrabi Theater? Yeah. It is no longer... Mm-hmm. And suddenly, I see Chubby Checker. Now, if you don't know Chubby Checker, no. so you'll have to Google Chubby Checker. He came out at that time with a very famous song, Let's Twist Again, yes. like we did last okay. summer. That you're, you know. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that was his big hit out. So he was all over the radio. And I thought, wow, I've got to have his autograph. So I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Chubby Checker, Will you give me an autograph? And he looks at me, and I thought he's going to tell me to, to take a walk. <laughs> and then he suddenly says to me, "What's your name?" So I said, "Uri Geller." And he said, "Look, Mr. Geller." He called me Mr. Geller. I was 13. He says, "I don't have a pen on me, and I don't even have a piece of paper. But look, across the street there's a kiosk. Let's go there." So he, he, we crossed the street. He took his time. He asked for a pen, a piece wow. of paper, and he signed to Uri Geller from Chubby Checker. And that was a, one of the, my, my most important lessons in life. So his kindness stuck with you. Yes. And you said, I'm going to pay it forward. Yeah, I just thought, hey, uh, I'll be nice to everyone too. Yeah, that's amazing. Before we begin, I want to clarify something because we're filmmakers. So I, w- I was wondering if the film rights... On your life story is it still on the shelf I mean is it still for for sale or is it sold already uh, if you're um, kind of giving me if you're proposing to do a major motion picture about my life yeah let's talk okay <laughs> so, so okay we're in although, like, although, like now uh, <laughs> no, no let's keep the business out of it no but let me tell you something interesting Seriously, which you though. don't know okay uh, because otherwise you wouldn't have asked the question they were you asked to. About 23 years ago, do you know who Ishai Golan is? He's a famous... He's the musician. No, no, he's a very, very famous Israeli actor. Hey, guys, I see that you're two nice Jewish kids, but you got to um, l- just... Yeah. Um, he's now broaden, religious, right? No, no, Not him? broaden your horizon about okay. actors. No, I think it's important for you to know. Ishai Golan is a very fine Israeli actor. Yeah. And um, 23 years ago, a producer, an Israeli producer came to me Doron Iran. Yeah, him I know. Yes, really? Yeah, I read his book. <laughs> and he, Doron says to me, oh, Uri, um, I, I'd love to make a motion picture, a film about, based on your life story. 
and he said, um, do you know directors? Now, at that time, my favorite director was a, a British director who, again, you might have never heard of before. His name was Ken Russell. Ken Russell did a great film called Women in Love. It was huge at that time, you know, 40 years ago. And then he went on and did Tommy with Elton John and Paddy Chayefsky's uh, Altered States. So he did some very big films. And I thought, that's it. I want Ken Russell to direct it. So I called up Ken Russell. Uh, of course, he knew who I was. And I said, Ken, will you direct a movie? He says, of course, Uri, I followed your career. And he says, but I want Sting to play your father. So I called Sting, went to see Sting in Hampstead, wherever he lived then. And Sting says, I look, he opens his diary and he says, I can't, you know Sting, yes? <laughs> yes you, you know yeah, him. Of course. He says, I can't make it. So then I said, okay, I'm going to go to David Bowie. So I go to David Bowie. He was coincidentally in London in a hotel. So I go, go up to his room and uh, he also opens his diary and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm doing concerts in America. And I saw on David Bowie's window seal. I don't think I ever talked, spoke about this. I saw at least 40 or 50 Marlboro cigarette boxes. And I looked at David and I said, David, you've got to stop smoking. It'll kill you. If you continue, you will be dead. And uh, I think I was right. He, he, you know, no doubt. Smokers. No doubt about it. So the film was made, but it wasn't David Bowie or, or um, Sting. It was a man called Terrence Stamp, who is another very big actor who played in Superman and so on. So the answer is there was a movie, but it's crazy. Ken Russell went wild. It was distributed by Disney, but it went to 60 countries, but it got the worst reviews ever. So it's time for a reboot. For a good film. Exactly, yeah. a remake. A remake. Okay, uh, okay. 2017 version. Yeah. So, um, first of all, for our listeners, yeah. so because, I mean, I think most of them will know who you are. But just to give kind of a, a, an overview, Uri Geller um, became uh, world-renowned, really, in, in the 70s um, for his unique abilities. Um, in, in, well, specifically at the beginning with spoon-bending and then um, with other psychic abilities. And uh, in the United States, in England. Um, worldwide. Worldwide. And uh, recently, I mean, this, this was kind of... Uh, great timing because recently uh the cia came out and revealed um that uh you were actually were tested and worked with them um and i want to actually read a quote from the the documents that they it's that a, they released a declassified uh Official CIA documents. Yeah, yeah. Which were secret up to last week. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which refer to uh, tests that were performed at the Stanford uh, Research Institute. Um, and the quote that I wanted to read was, As a result of Geller's success in this experimental period, we consider that he has demonstrated his paranormal perceptual ability in a convincing and unambiguous manner. So... First of all, I want to Amazing. ask you, that's, that's unbelievable, but I want to ask you, how did, how did this all start, the work with the CIA? Okay, it started um, by, w when I was a child living in Cyprus, um, our little hotel became a safe house for Mossad agents. Did you know that or not? No. Uh, my, my stepfather died. Uh, we, we stayed with this little, what's called a pension rich, 14 rooms, and Mossad found out that we are from Israel, so they turned it actually into a, a safe house where um, Mossad spies would come from in from Israel to Nicosia, and from there they would fly to Arab countries to do their work. Mm -hmm. And one of the spies, I, I knew he was a spy, C call it intuition, call it telepathy, but I approached him one day and I said, you have... You, uh, um, I told him in Hebrew, Tamiragel, Nachon, you're you're a spy, aren't you? And he was shocked. And then I showed him the key bendings. How old were you at the time again? About thirteen. That was it when I came to visit my father, and um, he was so impressed by the spoon bending mm -hmm. that he said, uh, "When you become eighteen, go back to Israel, 
join the paratroopers and go to officer's school and then find me because I'm going to get you into the Mossad. And I was, you can imagine, a 13-year-old mm-hmm. kid just after Bar Mitzvah being told by, by a real Mossad agent that I'm going to become a super spy. And um, so it already began there. And then, but even when I was seven or eight, I remember that I was always transfixed and I was fascinated by the Bible story of the, uh, you remember when Moses sent spies into Canaan and mm-hmm. they came back with a, a shkol, with a grape. Big, big uh, yeah, grape bunch. Yeah, and they went to spy there. I was always fascinated by that. Now, jumping back to the CIA. So I went to, I did exactly what you have said. Uh, and in the middle of officer school, I, I buy Yediot Achonot, the local paper, and I'm, I'm, I'm shocked because on the headline it says, it reads, Yov Shacham died yesterday in a raid. And, and that was it. And my dreams were shattered. So when I became well known in Israel, I started circulating with people from mm-hmm. you know, high ranks. High, high ranks. ranks. Because it was, also, uh, it was Golda Meir that what made me when I told her to go to the toilet and do a secret drawing. And, uh, what, 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 what? I don't know. Oh, you didn't story. know that? No, that story ah. I don't know. Okay. So Hold when, on. Let's, let's. Okay. <laughs> so when uh, we were very poor, my mother and I, uh, we lived in a tiny little uh, one-room apartment in Betzal El Yafe 13, uh, Pinaj de Rot Rothschild. And I wanted to succeed. My dream was to become rich and famous because I knew I had these talents. And uh, the, the only possession I had was a scooter, a white Vespa. And I had amazing girlfriends, gorgeous girlfriends. And I would take, zoom them around for photo sessions. And one day, a male uh, model d- doesn't show up. So the photographer looks at me and says, you take his place. And I said, what, you want to photograph me? He says, yes, lie down on the towel with your girlfriend. And it was a, a advertisement for Atta towels. You, it's way beyond your... Mm-hmm. Atta was a famous... Um, the only clothes you yeah, could buy in Israel. Was Atta. And two weeks later, I open again Yediot and Mariv, and I see myself full page <laughs> uh, lying down. So the word got out. Poster this, boy. This, this young guy uh, who da- good looking, does modeling. And, and one day I thought to myself, hang on, how long am I going to do this? And I, I said to the photographer, one of the photographer, you won't believe it, he lives in Old Jaffa. His name is Norbert. I said to him, do you have a spoon in the kitchen? He says, yes. So I bend it. He's freaked out. And he says, Uri Geller, how did you do this? I'm giving a house party today. No one will believe me. You've got to come and demonstrate your abilities, your powers. And immediately I raised up my fingers and I said, how much are you going to pay me? I went to the party and stop me if you think I'm no, not no, no, no. Do go on. And I went to the party, house party, and there was the moment where I was shocked. I was shocked from the response of the people. A rather trivial spoon bending was amazing to those watching. Mm-hmm. And these house parties became, um, you know, from, from photographers... Um, the word got out. This is 68, 69? 68, 69. The, the, the word got out uh, from photographers to lawyers, from lawyers to judges, from judges' homes to generals. And one day, Golda Meir is in one of these house parties. So I thought to myself, this is my chance. She's the prime minister by the now? The prime minister. So I woke up to her. I always carry, a, not today I ca- carry a Sharpie, but then there were no Sharpies. <laughs> there were big lords they were called lords markers and i give her a piece of paper and i tell her golda lechi lebeta shimosh means go to the toilet to the restroom <laughs> lock yourself in and do a secret drawing don't show it to anyone uh, she, uh, and i'll read your mind when you come out she says no one no one can read my mind so she goes she shuts herself in everyone is waiting she comes out, and by oh, the way... You did this with everybody's attention. Yeah, it was in the middle yeah, of yeah. the party. Okay, yeah. And, and, and by the way, n- I don't think anyone ever in any place around the world ever sent a prime minister to the toilet on command. I didn't know they go to yeah. the toilet. <laughs> but she did. <laughs> she comes out, 
and she clutches the drawing very kind of in her fist and I just drew it. She drew a Star of David. It was the same size, millimetric. And the next day, it was the beginning of my career because she was being interviewed on Israeli radio mm -hmm. and suddenly the presenter asks her, um, Golda Meir, what do you predict for the future of Israel? And she says without hesitation, don't ask me, ask Uri Geller. Oh my wow. God. That was it. Honestly, the phone in my tiny apartment starts ringing. Interpreters, agents, managers. Anyhow, the Mossad somehow made a deal with the CIA in 1972 and they let me out of Israel straight to Stanford. That's how it all started. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. then you got to the to Stanford in 1973 and the, and the tests were... Now, following the tests, um, I, I have to ask you, because I want to kind of jump from the tests to today, because following the tests um, there, you know, and your career, throughout your career, you've you've um, encountered skeptics. And I'm, I'm, the first person you showed the spoon bending, you said, the first question he asked you was, how did you do that? So that's kind of where's the question. The trick? Exactly. Where's the trick? That's kind of the question that's going through everybody's mind. And for years, that was probably what you encountered. And then after all these years of skeptics and doubting, you you know, a couple of days ago, these these documents are revealed. I wonder how, how did that, how did okay. that feel? Okay, look, um, the controversy around, first of all, you both know, I'm shrouded with controversy. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is Google and you'll see me on Johnny Carson, etc., etc. Uh, skeptics trying to debunk me and so on. The, the controversy began here in Israel in 1968. Uh, uh, Amnon Rubinstein, who was the dean of um, University of London of Law, invited me to a show. Uh, it was called Boomerang, which never aired because I walked out. I was attacked. I didn't know how to handle um, skeptics and controversy. And um, then Aulam Azeh, which was a magazine, it's no longer run by Uri like Avneri. the sun. Uh, yeah, even worse than that. <laughs> um, came out with a headline, Uri Geller i Ramai. I, I, Uri Geller is a fraud. But what was amazing is that I thought that I would be destroyed when I saw that magazine. But that night... Um, all, all the tickets were sold out and there were 500 people stood outside that couldn't buy tickets. So I thought to myself, what is going on? And that's when I started realizing that controversy is good for you. Mm -hmm. No matter what they say about you, as long as they spell your name correctly. And I, I look at Oscar Wilde, one, 100 years ago, Oscar Wilde said, there's only one worse thing in life than being talked about. And that's not being talked about. And the best example is Donald Trump. Look at Donald Trump. You know, again, I'm showing off now, but I predicted his, yeah. right. you know, on Facebook. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump, what was he not called during his campaign? A liar, a con man, a fraud. And he's now the, the president of the United States. <laughs> yeah. So in the beginning, it hurt me. But then when I started working for the CIA... It was a great cover for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The skeptics, the show business, I needed the controversy to stay safe. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something that nobody knows, but one day I remember I was concerned about my safety. So I told my manager, whose name was Yasha Katz, come out with an announcement that Uri Geller is a fraud. And I created a lot of that. Because I needed the cover-up. It was yeah. an inbuilt safety device for me. Yeah. Now, putting that aside, I, I owe a lot to the skeptics, a, a big thank you and a million bouquets of flowers because they created the myth around me. They mm -hmm. created the mystique. Do you understand? Of is course. it real? Is it not? The curiosity is always ignited by controversy. Yeah. Show me, and besides, show me a successful man or woman, and I'll show you controversy. But still, when the when the files were um, published, it's still, I guess, no sense of a little bit of justice being made in retrospect. 
you mean beat. a vindication? Uh, a, mm-hmm. that and now I'm, you know all those years. Yeah, you yeah, laughed yeah, at me, yeah. and now and now here it is. Well, no, because I always I know that I'm real. <laughs> you know, I, I've gone through the tests. By the way, these tests were also published in Nature magazine. A new scientist talked about it, but yeah. now it's a seal a of approval. But you know, yeah. you're saying about you knew that you were what you were. But I want to ask you because the, the, it was videoed. We photographed the tests you can go online and watch the BBC documentary on your website or or the secret uh, w- hold on or the secret CIA film and you will be shocked what other tests I went through it's on my website urigeller.com yeah. yes there's a half an hour film straight from Stanford Research Institute putting the telepathy aside the bunch of grapes and the devil there are many mm. many drawings and Then they asked me to levitate a one gram weight. Have you seen that film? I, I've so far, I didn't see the levitation, but I see when you indicated where there's water the in cans. the cans. Yeah, yeah, the cans. Yeah. So we'll put links so to all these. What I want to post. ask you, though, because in the film, you can see how thrilled you are each time the, the result is successful. And to me, it felt very authentic because, like, I mean, if, like, a con artist or... Or, uh, or a magician would go to such tests with very like very secure of himself and the, the moment where you're you're so thrilled about the good results like uh, it confirmed it to you as well absolutely I'm always How do you explain that I'm always thrilled I mean even yesterday I had a show in a lot and um, the, the I kind of try to reinvent my act sometimes so today I try to bend the golf club. And that's very difficult. It's 60-40, meaning 60 doesn't work, 40 it does. And yesterday on, a, on the stage, um, I melted it. A kid held it, rubbed it, and it melted and broke. And I was thrilled. I'm thrilled because I love what I do. Um, I'm a bit of a show-off. I'm a bit of an eccentric. I, um, I take selfies with everyone. So I'm still maybe it's a child at heart because I still am enthusiastic about what I do, especially at Stanford, because I was very scared from those tests. I didn't you know. You were scared. Of course. It, they, a, an astronaut actually lured me there. I didn't want to go first. You see, it, it was a whole chain of events. They sent a doctor here mm-hmm. called Dr. Puharich to test me. First, he, he rented a small apartment in Herzliya. And when he saw that it's real, he said, now time to go to the CIA. No, he didn't tell me CIA. I didn't know. I thought it was only scientific tests. Mm-hmm. And then um, an astronaut called Edgar Mitchell, Captain Edgar Mitchell, who was a six man on the moon, mm-hmm. wrote me an amazing letter. And, he, and what I really was impressed by is the picture of him walking on the moon and saying to my best friend, Uri Geller, From Edgar Mitchell, from Ed Mitchell, wow, oh. an astronaut is writing me a letter with a picture, and that was that's what convinced me to to come to America, which was very brave for itself that you agreeing to those that it's not obvious it's it was very brave, I think I, I don't know if brave, but it was maybe I also needed that validation you needed it for yourself yeah. for me sense. not uh-huh. only for me, but for my friends and uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. the controversy in Israel, and I thought, okay. Uh, but uh, they kept it a secret because I, I continued doing amazing missions because for them. Because it scared them, I, I guess, also. No, they were, they were, no, on the contrary, they were concerned that the Russians ahead, are ahead of the Americans in psychological research. There was a lady in America called, in Russia called Nina Kulagina. I don't know if you ever heard of her. She would sit by a table, concentrate, and she would start moving objects on the table. That really concerned the mm-hmm. CIA mm-hmm. because computerization was its in infancy. Mm-hmm. They were worried that the mind can penetrate computers, and they, that's why they got me. And when they saw that, well, I mean, otherwise they wouldn't send me to the Lawrence Livermore Radiation Labs to see if I can trigger a nuclear weapon. Yeah. So I, I, I want to go back to the, to the Stanford uh, videos because I do the, the reaction there is so genuine that I wonder if there was really if there were moments where you were you were asking yourself, because of all the controversy surrounding it, if there was moments of self-doubt, of real self-doubt, and then, of course, and that was just validated. Always there's always a moment of self-doubt, whether it's science or one of my secret missions or on a stage. I mean, I'm just a human being at the end of the mm-hmm. day. Ask any showman, any singer, 
any um, actor, you're in the, the movie industry, any sports person, any politician, they always doubt themselves somewhere mm -hmm. because it's human nature. It's yeah. a natural reaction. We're animals. And the thing about spies, because, you know, I was thinking, you know, now that we know about Arnold Milchin, are you friends, by the way? Do you, do you, are you acquaintances? I know him. I know him. Because he was well, also... doesn't know him? Yeah. He was also allegedly yes. an Israeli spy. Yes. So, uh, so uh, planted in Hollywood... Yes. Again, it's, there's a, so maybe there's a pattern here, and maybe I don't know. Maybe also Mike Brunt was. I don't know. I'm just starting to think. Maybe you, you know what I'm saying. Well, that is Gal really. Gadot. By the way, that is Gal really uh, freaky that you. Who did you just? You did you mention just Mike Brandt yeah. now? How much do you know about him? Just you know, less more to me. That is. Uh, he's. F let let me tell you about the little story about him. Okay. I was on my Vespa. In, uh, driving in higher con street and I had to pee so I stopped at the Dan hotel left my Vespa outside walked in and I hear this beautiful voice from the bar somewhere and it, I go inside and these see this good-looking man with lots of hair we, we were you know I he my hair was we were almost the same age and uh, when he finished this song I woke up to him and I tell him what's your name he says Mike Brandt And I said, you are huge. What are you doing singing in the Dan Hotel? You should be doing records. You should go out of Israel. And he did. So that's my favorite song, by the that's way. That's what to me. Yeah, because you are totally different generations now. The fact that you brought up his name. And still his suicide is pretty mysterious. You know that. Well, Now, that's but, where I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, but if you Google, if you Google um, stars, movie stars, is spying, you will find a series. There were lots of British movie stars who, mm -hmm. who were spies. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the basis of, I mean, not in Hollywood, but uh, I mean, they came from Hollywood, but the Argo movie with uh, Ben Affleck, where they went to Iran to help uh, facilitate the escape of the... the um, hostages yeah, there they use yes. the cover so, the, so as, uh, it is it's a good cover to use uh, hollywood as uh, absolutely yeah. and uh, s uh because yeah. i think people are so so like uh, taken aback by the whole idea of fame and glory that you know they 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 forget to kind of be skeptical and ask questions look behind so they, the back so they're like oh famous people and then they exactly. you know, they get a little nervous absolutely and, and i yeah. would not be surprised if right now there are famous people who are spying Uh, you see, because the espionage business today is uh, a bit more complicated. Why? Because our technology is so advanced mm -hmm. that you can really gather information today um, anywhere, anyhow, in, in all different methods, starting from satellites. Uh, you know, in the 70s, satellites could not see through clouds. Mm -hmm. Today they can. NSA is listening to every phone call. Even if, if it's, they're not listening, then they're recording. All your emails can be read, WhatsApps, SMS, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's all there. NSA can get a new... And that means even Israelis can and French can and Germans can. So at least one person is following our Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Really. I'm telling you, you, you you're pro no, if not following, but you're recorded. You're being recorded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they could just go ahead so, and... So the reason them. I'm bringing in the human factor is that most, most of the time the human factor can really wriggle itself into areas that conventional technology cannot reach mm -hmm. so they use unconventional way and then they are the remote viewers and i'm i'm happy to say that i started the remote viewing program for the americans these are people who are highly intuitive they sit in darkened rooms in front of computers and they send their mind through space and time and they bring back information the information they bring back can be checked and correlate and they can see immediately if it's right or wrong and they're being used except they went deep black mm -hmm. do you know what deep black means the, the top secret deep black means that they're, no they're doing it note it's it's not in the press the cia are keep are keeping it um top secret now i want to go back to the late 60s early 70s because you know we're like we're in israel yeah Uh, it's the startup nation, and it seems like you were one of the first startups. You were a startup. You made yourself 
the startup and you used many many talents apart from your the talent mm-hmm. to build yourself you're an amazing storyteller you know we're filmmakers we can tell you could have been a director you know listen to you telling a story is like listen to Scorsese or Tarantino tell a story that's a great compliment thank uh, you I'll do your podcast again okay <laughs> gladly uh, it's amazing so I'm saying how did you approach the mission of building yourself as a startup abroad what happened is the following is We were very poor, and my my mind insisted that I make it in life because of my mother. It was always my mother. Uh, she was a seamstress and a waitress. I remember going to Shukopish Peshim to the flea market. She would buy American parachutes from which she would sew dresses for women. We collected plastic. There was no plan. It was bacalite spoons and washed them and sold them. And I thought, how do I climb out of this poverty? I wanted to buy her a radio. I wanted to buy her a new dress. So I, I guess I, I already then happened to come across what today is called the law of attraction. And if you don't know about it, it's a secret. I will tell you and all, all your listeners, um, I believed in myself. I was optimistic and I was positive and I would imagine I would visualize the things I want to achieve inside my mind and I always said if you can go there with your mind you can go there with your body and I did it and when I went abroad I went to America that vision I kept playing that vision in my mind and There were no plans. I, there, was no, there were no agents or managers and no PR people and no image makers, nothing, even today. I have no one. I, you know, I, I just go with the flow. But I believed. And the law of attraction is very simple. In 1924, a very clever man um, came up with an, an, an amazing scientific equation, E equals MC squared. And of course, we all know it's Albert Einstein. It was Einstein. one of ours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Albert Einstein. And um, he proved to the world scientifically that everything in the universe is made from energy. And energy cannot be destroyed. So even our thoughts are energy. Now, if I pick up your phone and I just drop it, you, it hits the table because we all know there is gravity. But wh- what most people don't know, only the ones who are extremely wealthy... And there are just a few people who are holding most of the wealth of this planet they knew that secret that there is another law in the universe and what it is it's a law of attraction if you think positive your energy your thought energy send goes out to the universe the universe doesn't know between good and bad it knows to return it so if you wish for something the universe returns it and it happens to you No matter how small, whether you want to sell your car, your apartment, you want to be successful, you want to make it big. But if you think negative, oh, I'm stressed, I'm a loser, I will never make it. You're sending that thought out and it returns back to you and you'll stay miserable. So I already knew that. So there was no big setup. Everything I wished for happened. Full stop. So to me, I proved myself that there is that thing. Call it, I don't know, universal law, psychic law, mystical law. But also law. Israeli chutzpah. Absolutely. Without my Israeli chutzpah and without my charisma, and I'm saying it shamelessly, this chutzpah, I would have never made it. It was chutzpah. When they slammed the door in my face, I walked through it. Mm-hmm. I took, I did not take, I, I couldn't take no for an answer. I created chutzpah. I generated Israeli chutzpah. And that's what I tell everyone today in the mentalism field. And, you know, I had a very successful TV show called The Successor, with Lior Sushar, the winner. And, and when I sat on that big chair and watched these mentalists, I didn't care how good they were with their act. What I cared about are three things, their personality, their charisma, and their character. If you've got those three things, you made it. So do you think that those three things 
correlate to to the abilities that you have? Do you think that the the more positive and the more resilient you are, the more optimistic you are, there's somehow some kind of correlation between that and no, I don't think it has correlation with my abilities or skills. Mm-hmm. Anyone can create that if you yeah. are like for instance, you are now film producers. So from tonight, from today, start thinking big. Start imagining it, it doesn't you know it doesn't cost you money. It's like waking up in the morning brushing your teeth. So you've got to do two things. You wake up tomorrow morning and this is a nice, Uh, for all your listeners this is why don't you also do this first of all first thing in the morning you open your eyes you put yourself in an attitude of gratitude that's the first thing you do still in bed you put yourself I'm repeating it again in an attitude of gratitude and what do you mean by that it's it's, it's self-explanatory. self-explanatory you just feel that wow I I'm really lucky look what's going on around the world There are so many other people in, in misery. Do you know that every three seconds, I'll count three seconds, 21, 22, 23, a baby just died from hunger somewhere around the world. Can you imagine that? The tragic, every three seconds, the baby dies. How dare you complain? And that's what I mean by gratitude. You know, did I, you hear it Y generation? <laughs> the what? The Ge- Y generate the generation Y. Yeah, yeah. You know? But then then the second thing is, imagine in your inner mind, I create an imaginary TV screen in which I put the picture or a little movie of what I want to achieve, whether it's that day, a week, this year. So from now on, m- you both work on on the next big project. Where is the money going to come from? you are going to imagine it. What's the movie? What's, you know, your, your directors. Yeah, that's the so, entrepreneur. That's how yeah. entrepreneur thinks. Steven Spielberg, I'll never forget. I walked into, I think it was Robinson's department store in Los Angeles and I walked up to a counter and his mother was selling their things. And she said to me, oh, Uri Geller, you know, my son is doing a movie about a big shark and uh, he's, he's such a positive young man. And I knew, Steven Spielberg, I didn't know his name, but she mentioned her son, yeah. and I knew this guy's going to become yeah. I guess it's big. also also in a sense a Jewish value what what you meant talking about here because that's how we thrived throughout the the, the generation for thousands of for years thousands we've of being years. prosecuted yes. and this is why I believe the Israeli mentalists are the best in the world mm-hmm. and then the Jewish mentalists take look at Houdini, look at David Blaine, look at David Copperfield. I mean I can go. <clears throat> on and on and on t- mentioning names of huge uh you know mentalists and magicians yes who made it big big time and you think it has to do with their resilience so i i um i want to ask you because you know we talked about the the history of the jewish people and there's uh the his the jewish people have no lack of traumas that they passed and you went through quite a quite a few traumas yourself throughout the throughout the years and you talked about your resilience so that that must have come in handy But um, I want to go back to one specific one because you mentioned in, in various places that you, in the Six-Day War, were active as a soldier and you experienced a certain trauma there. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, it, it was actually the biggest trauma in my life. It was, um, we were under fire on the French Hill in Ramallah. That's where uh, King Hussein started building his summer villa. And we were attacked by Peyton tanks. My, my unit, which was called Sayer Duchifat, Uh, we had light armored vehicles and we were being taken down one by one. My captain, Eucheni, died in front of me, just sunk into the vehicle. Uh, the driver lost his leg. I pulled him out. And while I was trying to put my soldiers under cover by a big cemetery wall, um, suddenly, out of nowhere, a Jordanian soldier jumps out and he's about to shoot me. And I have my Uzi in my hand. And uh, he was my age, young, black mustache. I look him in the eye. He looks at me. And it was just an amazing uh, milliseconds. All my life uh, flashed in my mind like a movie. Everything. I saw the divorce. I saw our childhood. I saw Cyprus, the war in Cyprus. And I snapped out of it And because I realized that whoever is going to press the trigger first will survive. And I was faster than him. 
shot him. I killed a man. My first reaction was strange. I did what I remembered seeing in Kolnoa Matmid, in, in Alembi, the American war films. The enemy dies, you, you take off the diskette, you know, you, and I took out his wallet and there was a picture of King Hussein in his wallet. I didn't realize what, I, what happened because the war continued and then I was wounded. But later on, it started sipping into my mind. You killed a man. Uri Geller. Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. And then it became uh, a real, it's called, I think it's called post-traumatic syndrome. But no one knew that then. No, it's a new, yeah. I hid it. You hid it. No, uh, it no was, one knew what post no, I guess, is. No, no, well, Viet, uh, Vietnam. I, I guess no one really, di- no yeah. one researched it. it. Yeah, yeah, no one researched yeah. it. And then it really translated into crazy things. Like when I lived in New York, Frank, I, I, um, I was obsessed by weapons. I don't think I ever talked about this. And Frank Sinatra and myself, we were the only two people in New York that had a license to carry eight weapons, guns, revolvers. On your body. On my body, on our body. I had a Concealed. license. It, there was, it was one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all different one. One was a Beretta, the other was Smith & Wesson, the other was a Colt. And so I was- all kinds of symptoms to the- I was so obsessed that I sometimes walked out of my apartment on 57th Street with Eight weapons and strapped how, to my body. How was this a result of, I mean, what were you walking around with a fear that? No, it was just, I was obsessed. And I'll never forget one day I was riding to Central Park in New York. And I had, I don't know if I had eight weapons, but at least four. And a, 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 a truck passed by and hit, hit my rib cage with its mirror. Mm-hmm. And it knocked me off the bicycle. And I was, I was I, f- I thought it broke my ribs. So, and I want to see how badly I'm hurt, what's bleeding. So I tore my shirt open. I, I forgot that I had a Derringer here, a Smith & Wesson here. You know, they were all in Bianchi. Bianchi is a great holster. Mm-hmm. On my leg, t- two or three. And people around me screamed. They thought I was a serial killer or something. And they started running away. Anyhow, I was that obsessed. Um. I want to ask you, can we talk about age? Because we're, we're, we're soon going to have some questions for the audience. But before you get to that, I, w- I want to talk about ca- age. age. I was d- December 20th. I turned 70. Ah, mazal tov. That's so that, amazing because you look 40. Uh, I, I swear. I'm going to do amazing. three podcasts <laughs> with you. <laughs> Keep them coming. No, no. You, you look amazing. It's, Thank it's you. unbelievable. But it, se- it feels like when watching old interviews and recent interviews, it seems that the years did good by you really in all senses. You feel, you feel I don't know how even to explain it, but I want to ask you that. I mean, how, di- how did age affect your life, your career? You came here to Israel, yeah. you settled here. How, does, uh, how did that affect you? Okay, look. Anyone who tells you that uh, it's great to be old, they're lying. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I st- I, I, I'm still on the side where I didn't do Botox and I didn't go to a plastic surgeon. And not yet, but I, I doubt. Um, there were a few years where I was so vain that when I started seeing white hair, I started coloring my hair, uh, dyeing it and all that. But then I thought and said, come on, Geller, who are you, <laughs> who are you kidding? I mean... You're 50, 60, uh, you know, you have, so then I stopped it because I, I realized how stupid I was. But, you know, you, you can slow down the aging process, but you cannot stop it. Um, all my life, I believed in um, living in a healthy body. So I was a vegetarian, kind of bordering on vegan. I exercised every day. I still exercise every day. I'm a positive thinker. Remember, positive thinking. You know, if you Google today, can positive thinking really stop strokes? The answer is very surprising. It can. Um, can positive thinking cure cancer? If you Google that, the answer is in, in serious papers, like the Observer in England, mm-hmm. that positive thinking can kill cancer cells. So I think co- the combination of eating the right foods, not not eating chemicals and additives and colorings and all that, I think you can kind of 
lengthen your but what lifespan. about your performance your your how you live your life your your character all that did it change over the years that's a very good question you know I don't know if anyone ever asked me that um, I have to think about that I I don't know I think I still go with the flow and and uh, be, I did reinvent myself I, as I said before I But age, no, I mean, look at do look, you f- still have look a passion at, to to perform? Yeah, look at Mick Jagger. Come on. He's <laughs> much you know agile than I. I mean, the guy is what seventy what? Yeah, and he jumps and rocks on the stage like it's sixteen year old. There are you know, so it's really in the mind. I think it's in the mind, but I'll tell you what else it is. And maybe again, this is a bit of an ego saying this. from my side and most celebrities won't talk about that but I thrive on your energy and um, how can I explain it when a performer um, walks in the street and he's being recognized that's like the, his fans are injecting into him or her some kind of a power some kind of a energy because they want to continue to be successful they want to s- continue looking good they want to create more CDs and being on the top whether it's movie stars or and the energy of of the audiences I think that is a very major part of success and longevity mm-hmm. yeah it's that simple connecting and Connecting with connecting people? with some kind of his um, spiritual energy you know that when I had this trauma in New York I also became bulimic mm-hmm. uh, did you know that yeah in the past and, and interviews, yeah I... and John Lennon sent me to Japan to find spirituality I I didn't know what spirituality was you know I heard of the word but I didn't know what it was so I cleansed myself in Tokyo in, in, in actually in a forest and right under Mount Fuji with mm-hmm. all my family I, I took my wife children mother brother-in-law and the reason I brought that up is because uh, uh, bulimia is an awful addiction you mm-hmm. know I devoured things in restaurants and then went back into the toilets and I vomited and I stuck um, toothbrushers when my finger wouldn't do the job I, I it was I looked like an Auschwitz survivor that's how John Lennon called me and even that, I knew that if I don't look good, if I'm hurting my body, I'm hurting my image that the audiences see me with. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That kind of the, the, your representation, like you're saying that the audience, the, it, it hindered the connection between hit, you. Yes, and because them. I was not well. I was feeling sick and I thought I'm transmitting that to my audience. And okay. that's why I had the willpower to stop. Just one day I went cold dead in the middle of Manhattan on 57th, of 57th Street and First Avenue. I could hardly get out of my Cadillac. I was so weak. I grabbed the roof and I shouted in the middle of the street, one, two, three, stop. And I never vomited again. Amazing. Well, we'll go for some questions from our audience. Can you... Yeah. find it while I read the first one so um Angelique do do Nikova asks yeah. you from New York she asks you since you saw uh, Donald Trump being elected as president does he does he, are you uh, seeing uh, a possibility of assassination God forbid or impeachment for Donald Trump how long do you predict he will be president that's a brilliant question but I there's no answer for me Uh, no comment on that one okay okay um, so we have some guy asking for the lottery numbers <laughs> is that uh, everyone asks obviously that. yeah yeah but, but it does it doesn't work like that so it, there's almost like a law yeah uh, you know when I um, in the 70s I walked into casinos in London and in New York and in Monte Carlo not in New York but in places where there are casinos and I won a lot of money just being able to predict where the ball will fall uh-huh And then something awful happened to me that made me stop. Uh-huh. Uh, and I realized that there's something governing around you. You cannot use your talents, your powers, your skills to do these. But then I did find oil 
uh, that uh, well that was okay to do yeah yeah so, for mexic for mex the mexico government yeah, mainly pemex pemex is a national oil company i found oil for them how does that work by the way dowsing i just sit dousing. with a map you sit with a map or you go by helicopter in a helicopter sit with a map in a helicopter and i just feel uh, where I, the oil might be and i put with my marker i put a black x and they drilled there and oil came out and the president of mexico was so impressed that he made me a Mexican citizen. I actually have a Mexican passport number one. Which is very rare. Ve- you can't get a passport if you're not born in Mexico. So he had to change the constitution, whatever. And, but I do have a Mexican passport. Okay, more questions? So we have one from Stephanie Lynn, which I think brings up an interesting uh, topic because she asks if um, uh, your, your personal suggestions for developing uh her psychic abilities which she says she believes everybody has so i wonder if uh, you know what your opinion on that is if if you um, think that this is something that everybody has or if it's how can yeah. you in, in, like uh yeah develop it. it look uh, first of all i never do one on one mentoring but um all my books are free to read on my website mm-hmm. most of my books and some of them are you know they have the the um, information how to maybe develop your powers how to become more positive I urge you to read Uri Geller's little book of mind power uh, it's free to read and I think you'll enjoy it and it'll empower you okay and um, she asks as well how has his abilities been a benefit to his life and how have they been an obstacle challenge in his life So I think the latter part is very interesting. Yeah, uh, no, no obstacle at all. Um, uh, it was always beneficial become, because it made me rich and famous, you know. I'm, again, I'm shamelessly saying it. Uh, so I stopped my mother from working. I bought her the television set. I got her out of uh, Tel Aviv and I, she lived with us until the day she died. Were there no times in your career, in your life where you said... You know, I just wish I, I didn't have this. Never, never. never. I love it. It's, uh, I wish my kids had it, but they, they tried bending spoons and it didn't what, work. What, how do they see... What, what, can you describe us how do they see your, your relationship, ca- your career and, and your abilities? Are they believers or are they... That's spect- a, a great pre- question. You know, Daniel, my son, who lives in London, he's a senior prosecutor there. And... Um, He was asked just recently by a journalist here in Tel Aviv, what do you think about your father's powers? And Daniel's answer was, I think, brilliant. He said, well, look, if um, he um, has real powers, and it's amazing, and, and it's one of a kind, but if it managed to trick the world, it's even bigger. <laughs> it's then, <laughs> it's wow, it's the biggest uh, entertainment uh, exposure that anyone ever yeah. did. So I, th- I thought that was a balanced answer. We have an ending for our future Hollywood movie, I think. Okay. Where, like, that's the final twist. twist. Um, so last, last question, I think, uh-huh. uh, Eitan. Um, you said uh, about the publications, they, they are just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. So maybe you can give us some heads up for other classified material we can look for look up to or I, I mean and who might publish more well for the, for sure the Mossad will never publish anything never. like that the CIA did I'm just stunned that they did that um, if uh, other agencies uh, I doubt I think this is it I, I you know it happened because of a lawsuit freedom of your yes, 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 yes. act and I think I only in what, America <laughs> yeah and And this reverberates all around the world. I just got an email from a Russian television show uh, who they, they want to you know ask questions because it had a lot to do with Russians. But it, uh, tr- believe me that it, it, that is the tip of the iceberg what they published. You know what we should do with your listeners? Yes. We'll create a little um, experiment. I'm going to draw something uh, and uh, you won't know what I'll draw. And then I'll fold it up, give it to you. You put it somewhere in a safe. Uh-huh. And um, I will beam that image to your listeners. Okay. And... Um, you have a pen, right? By the way, did you bring a spoon? 
I have you, a spoon. I knew that. I'm <laughs> I do have a spoon. You do? Oh, wait. I do. Oh my god. Let me uh, let me do wait um you my have marker is in I'll there. Bring it. I'll bring it. Give me you. the coat. Yes. I actually I had the spoon because we uploaded the uh, video yesterday of us kind of uh, doing a Facebook live video yeah. to ask our uh, listeners to ask questions. And I was going to do a little thing with a spoon of me trying to bend it and we, obviously uh, uh, not we'll succeeding. Ta- we'll, uh, we'll take pictures. But you, do you remember the first Matrix with Keanu Reeves? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I created that scene where he's being taught to bend the spoon. Yeah, he said homage to you in a sense. I, I, that, get that it, was, I, I love that uh, scene. And also, I, I can't remember if I mentioned it, but George Clooney played me in... The Man Who Stared at Goats. Yeah. And uh, Robert De Niro played me in um, a movie called Red Lights. So, yeah, I was right. I have my marker. Yay. Wow. Well, it's the so, old-fashioned one, too. So we, can, yeah, we can see what you're drawing or we can't see? No, you will not. Because we I'll, don't see. No, okay. I'll put it under here. I'll okay. draw something. Okay. We'll very, I'll, I'll draw a very simple image. And um, People, you'll post what you think. No, or I'll give, yeah, I'll give yeah. this to you. And um, I will also write, I'll do three, three little things. Okay. You bring the spoon in the meantime. Okay. I now fold it up and I'll hand it to you. Yes. Promise me that you won't look I at it. Promise. But it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you Promise look at it or not. Oh, I won't lose um, it. I'll cherish it. And now we'll ask our audience to post. So, so what? What we give me? Okay. What, what we have Just to? What we will do? Hold yes. on. What we'll do is, we. Th- this is a, a long, big ice cream spoon. Yeah. What? Well, hold on. What we will do now yes. is I am beaming the image to all of you, to to the listeners. Where are you, listeners? By the way, Israel and in the United States. Okay. While I'm doing this. I will. Can I shoot? Can I? Yeah, you know, I'll bend so, the spoon okay. and d- describe what's happening here, please. Just so he's second. holding. Just there, it's going. Look. He's holding the end. Wow, that's unbelievable. Wait, he's wait, holding the end of the spoon, the part where he used to scoop, and he's just I'll rubbing the hand moment. of it. Look. Now, I have to say, though, because this is amazing. Yeah. I, I brought this spoon. I have to sign it for you. I brought this spoon from my work in really? Savion. I actually stole this spoon from my office. Let I hope my bosses it. aren't aren't watching. Okay, uh, everybody at home, no, for a okay, moment, so, yeah. concentrate. I'm now visualizing the image that I drew on the piece of paper. Yes. I'm also calling it by name. Yes. And now I'm beaming into your mind a name of a capital city. I'm going to say one, two, three, and I'm going to send the name of the capital city. One, two, three. Again, one, two, three. And one more time, one, two, three. And I'm also visualizing something in that capital city. I'm visualizing it. That's the end of our uh, ESP experiment. And you will give out. I don't know how you receive. um, Can I? Yeah, of course. I'm going to sign this for you. You see it's continuing. It's still bending. Yes. Um, do you assi- shall I sign it in Hebrew and in English? Yes. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, oh, you, you want to use that in the... Po- uh, sure, you can. So here is... See? Here is amazing. a spoon. Amazing. Wait, hold on. Look at... L- f- fill my eye one more time. I'm visualizing the, vi- the image right now. And I'm saying the name of the capital cities anywhere around the world. It's a simple city. And I'm visualizing something in this city. That's it. Okay. Okay. Wow. Uri. You know, I have no makeup on and no yeah. that. So <laughs> no need. Roll. No need for makeup. How many minutes have we been talking we're, already? We're 57 minutes. It's time to, to say goodbye. Perfect. It was such an honor. A pleasure. Thank you. You know, a dream come true. I want to um, uh, give my um, last words to everyone. You know, I get emails 300 a day. A lot of them for teenagers who see me all around the world in television shows. And they say, oh, Mr. Geller, please teach us how to bend a spoon. My answer to them is this. Forget spoon bending. Instead, focus on school. Believe in yourself. Become a positive thinker. Create a target goal to go to university. Never, ever smoke. Never touch drugs. And always think of success and be in an attitude of gratitude. I love you all. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast. Thank you, Uri. Eitan, did you hear it? Do not smoke. I got a lot of things on that list. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much.